everybody. Welcome to episode six of Eat, Drink, Write, an Urban Fantasy Whiteboard. I am Sherry Ellison. And I'm Taylor Ellison. And today we're going to talk about subplots. So first, what are you drinking? A margarita. Yummy. I am drinking a vodka soda with extra lime. Yum. And what are we eating? Uh, chips and salsa for me. And I've got some keto chips that are actually avocado chips and some cheese dip that um, I can also have the salsa with those and the cheese dip. So. No, the salsa is mine. <laughs> it's all yummy. <laughs> I wanted to remind everybody that we do have that contest going. Um, it is where our listeners can win free merch. And we have posted it all over our social media. I think we talked about it the, during the last episode. What you have to do is subscribe on iTunes and leave a review and then email us. You don't have to leave the, uh, leave the review on iTunes. You can leave it wherever you want to. Just email us so we know where to find it. Email us your address so we can send you all the good stuff. We've got spiral notebooks, sticky notepads, and some magnetic calendars for you guys. Um, and again, we are um, we have listeners all over the world, which is so cool to me. Yeah. Um, and I just want to thank all of you. Yeah, thank you guys so much. It's awesome. Okay, so let's jump into subplots. And I think you said you've got an actual definition for us. I do have a definition. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about main plots last, uh, last episode, but subplots are also equally important, I think. Um, and so the definition I have is that it's a secondary plot or side story that unfolds along with the main plot. Um, it adds complications and obstacles for your main character, and it adds to story conflict. I like that. that. That's a good definition. Yeah. You can have subplots. You know, a lot of the stories in urban fiction are series. And so yeah. you can have subplots that carry throughout more than one book. Yeah. Or you can have subplots that are even in a tiny part of the book. It might just be in the beginning and that particular subplot gets done. Or it could last the entire book. Right. But it does have to carry the main plot line it has to um what is the world word um move that main plot forward drive, it, yeah. drive that plot so yeah it needs to advance the main plot that was the word i was looking for advance yes, yes. i'm a writer <laughs> um and it should help the story be richer um i think it's i think it's really important to like put as much thought into a subplot as you do your main plot i think so too because i think like i feel like if your subplot falls short then it's gonna leave you know, a dissatisfying read for mm -hmm. your audience. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, I like the fact that it might be a subplot, not that your main character is having to deal with, but it could be a subplot of a secondary character. Oh, yeah. Which then makes that secondary character important, too. Yeah, and I think that makes the book so much richer when mm -hmm. you have, when you do bring in secondary characters and give them their own issues, and because they're people, too, and they have their own desires and, like, what they want to do. So bringing in those conflicts... Um, and seeing how it affects the plot, the main plot of your novel, I think can just make the story that much richer. I think so too. And I, I love secondary characters. Some oh, yeah. of the stories that I, I read, my favorite character is not necessarily the main character. I love the secondary character. Yeah, definitely. But it can also, in addition to driving the main plot, it can interrupt the main plot. So. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah. So you've got your plot where she's supposed to, you know, solve this crime sure. or um, travel to this place but this subplot might pop up and it can be a rock in and of itself right we talked about throwing, throwing rocks. rocks yeah um and so this subplot the secondary character perhaps is in danger and the main character has to go and help the secondary character which is not necessarily where she was in, uh, originally going. Right. So it's like it can be they can be rocks, True. which also helps create tension in your book because we're as the reader sitting here going, but but you're supposed to be going over here. Please go that way. Why are, why are you <laughs> going over here? But then you understand it because she's got some reason to go and and pursue this secondary plot. Right. Uh, it makes the world more real. I think. I agree. Because so, I mean that that's how it happens. You know you have. Your main plot, like my my main plot, is to go to work and make money and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I have my own little subplots to life where, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I like to play World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. and, oh, I like to hang out with my family on the weekends. And, oh, I, you know, I'm dating someone. So, like, that kind of thing. You you know, it's it's very reminiscent of 
real life. I think so too. I like that too. They can be humorous as well, which <laughs> yeah. I am a big fan of humor. I feel like that's probably your favorite type I, of subplot. I think so. I, I, I rarely, well, I don't say rarely, my favorite book plot has lots of humor anyway. Yeah. That is, I'm the lighter edge of the genre as yeah, opposed to yeah. the darker edge of the genre, although I have written some dark ones. Mm -hmm. um, but I enjoy the the humorous ones, and I love when my characters make me laugh out loud. I mean, it's just, I love it. I mean, you and your fairies. I, I Absolutely. Um, in my very first book that I'm working on now, which is why I'm talking about it because it's fresh in my mind right now, mm -hmm. my one of my secondary plots or subplots is a bumbling apprentice who oh, yeah. is, I mean, and he gets himself into so much trouble and it's so funny. Um, the, the, uh, he, he is a, a trip. <laughs> Whereas meanwhile, the main plot is not always happy and fun. There's, you know, death and, um, all kinds of evil things happening. So to have Clinton yeah. as this bumbling apprentice who stumbles onto these things. It gives a little bit of a uh, comedic relief. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And so, and that's part of what a subplot can help as well with is comedic relief when you have really dark things going on. Yeah. Well, along those same lines, I do have a list of types of subplots. Oh, what's that? What you got? Um, so I got this from uh, this website article, ezinearticle.com by John Hallis. Um, I had never heard of this before, but never heard of it. He, he had some really interesting um, information. So the first one is romance, okay. uh, a romance subplot, which I think is pretty typical in a lot of books. Um, I don't think it's like necessary to have a romance uh, subplot. I know like a lot of things say that you should, um, but I think it's like one of the more common subplots. Do you have romance subplots in any of your books? I think literally all of every, them. Every one of them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. And that's just kind of how it worked out, especially like when I start getting characters together and, you know, they're talking and like sometimes it just happens. It just and happens, so yeah. Therefore, I have one. Um, the second one is a political subplot. Oh. Um, so things, I guess, dealing with politics in the world, which like in my current work, like I'm dealing with Mac and she's exposed magic. Um, and that's going to be a lot of political downfall on her. Mm -hmm. um, like within the magical community that she knew nothing about? She still doesn't really know anything okay. about it. Um, but no, just even in terms of, like, in general, uh, politics, because suddenly the magic exists. In my book, that, my, that very first book mm -hmm. um, with Clinton, The Apprentice, there is a lot of political subplots going on because she is queen. And so that brings the politics of people oh, yeah. who want to take over her throne and people, you know, the whole politics of she's young, and so she has to learn how to... She is not very filtered, so it's hard for her to learn how to be politic. So right. there, there is a lot of political weaving and plotting going on in, in that particular book. Yeah, definitely. I can see that. Mm -hmm. um, the third one that I want to talk about was uh, historical subplots, which I think, you know, you have background of your world and, like, say that something's happened in the past and it affects what is going on oh. in the plot now. Um, is, that's how I took it. Um, you know, I and back to that same, using this work I'm working on right now, Yeah, something happened ages ago, so long ago that people don't even remember it. Right, and I imagine it affects it, what's going on in your does. main plot. It does, so I guess I've got a little bit of an, a historical yeah, subplot Yeah, which, too. you know, a lot of these on this list I had never really thought about, and I agree with most of them, and we'll get to the ones where I'm like, I don't quite understand, but okay. it's interesting. So the fourth one is a character subplot. So I think that's what we were talking about with like the secondary characters. Say that one again. Uh, the character subplot. Character subplot. And I'm think... sorry, I'm being distracted by my dog. She's <laughs> sitting at the door crying because She's we whining. have locked ourselves away. And and we've locked ourselves away with food. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, I'm intentionally locked ourselves away. <laughs> In part due to the food, um, but she's out at the door crying, so I, I, I'm sorry about that. Um, no, no worries. Um, character subplots. So okay. I think that's what we were talking about earlier with, like, secondary character oh, true. Um, uh, subplots. Okay. Which can, I think, affect main plots a lot as well. Then there's one called a macabre sub subplot. Macabre. And I had no idea what he was talking about when I was reading about it at first, okay. but... The way that he explains it is that it's an explanation of a villain's intentions. And so what I got from that was in, like, um, say you're reading 
uh, George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones okay. books, and I've only seen the series, so sorry if I butchered the the books. But in my in my head, I imagine he does. You know, he's got all these main characters that he goes with, and then he's got his villain, and he can go to his villain's point of view and and do some things there. And you get to see what the villain is doing, what the antagonist is doing. Um, there's another series I read called the Sword of Truth series. And I never it, did read that one. Yeah, and it's a it's a high fantasy, mm-hmm. um, and it follows. Uh, two main characters, Richard and Kaylin, and for most, for the most part, it just follows them, and it's their point of views. But every now and then, we'll get a chapter from the villain's point of view and what what he's doing, and and he leaves it where it's just like, oh, the villain's up to something. Something's gonna happen in the future. Um, this is why he's doing it. We kind of get a glance into the villain's. Path. Do you think that to have that kind of subplot, you have to actually go to that? character's point of view or can you see that subplot through the eyes of a different character that's an interesting question Mm -hmm. i think i think you could i well to be honest i think you can do literally anything with writing i mean true like i was trying to think in karen moaning Mm -hmm. her uh fever series Mm -hmm. we didn't ever necessarily get into kavruk's head throughout the story right but we saw the subplots that were going on through the eyes of our other characters, seeing what was happening. I think that that would count. I think so, too. Because that still counts as a subplot. Because and we're seeing yeah. it and, and living it, and it is a distraction, and it is a separate plot from the main plot line. Right. Interesting. I have That is the first time I ever thought of that. I no, never... same. And, and to call it a macabre... Uh, subplot. I had never heard a term like that before applied mm-hmm. to plots, like a macabre plot. I don't know. I just well, never... It could also mean horror. True. You know, there are horror plots, too, within... Or there can be. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. No, this is how he explained it, was the, the villain's villain. intentions. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um. So the next one is a... So now we're starting to get into the ones where I don't quite... I've never experienced it myself. I've never read anything about these kinds of things. So this one is uh, artful and environmental subplots. So when I was reading about it, he said, you know, your environment can be changing or your environment can also affect the plot. Um, so think about, like, climate change that we're going through right now. I was now. thinking maybe earthquakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be an environmental subplot that yeah, helps think- create tension. And So my dad really likes end-of-the-world movies. Um, natural disaster movies and that uh, like in itself is just a I mean it's the main plot in that right. case but in any other novel where you have an earthquake and they're like gradually getting worse or um, an incoming hurricane I think would also count mm-hmm. as like a uh, an environmental subplot and it could increase tension because you're fighting against time with a hurricane you know it's coming and you're trying to get certain things done or get to a certain place before that disaster happens right interesting and then artful what is artful you know, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure how to explain that one. And he didn't have much explanation of it himself, so I didn't write. I didn't write too many notes on it. Maybe our listeners will have some ideas of what that means, or maybe they've used that themselves. I'd love to hear it if you have. Yeah. Um, and then the last subplot that he has is a thought path, is what he calls it. And in my mind, that means it's uh, inner character development. Okay. Um, and it's more about the way a character thinks as they go through the novel. And does that thinking change? Are they a different person by the end of the book? Because each, every book ha- should, I, I, I think, have character development. Mm-hmm. That the character's got to grow. Agreed. And so I, to categorize that as a subplot is interesting to me because it's, I mean, I guess it is a subplot. Mm-hmm. Because it's not the main thing, oh, she's got to go save the world. Right. It's... The thoughts and the and her feelings and how her perception is changing during the course of her going to save the world. So yeah, exactly. that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty neat. Those are the seven subplots that he listed, and I thought all of them were really interesting. And some of them were, I, I don't know what artful subplots are. Yeah, I'm curious. I might have to ponder that and come up with some thoughts. Yeah. Interesting. All right, so what else did you have? Oh, just to follow up on that thought path subplot. Yes. Which is about their thoughts. Um, I think emotional growth is also a subplot that kind of goes hand in hand with character development. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, thoughts and um, emotions are 
tied into one. And I think that mm-hmm. should definitely be included on a list of subplots. Yeah, that makes sense, too. Yeah. The, you know, I talked about how subplots a lot of times are like rocks. I mean, I think you could probably characterize subplots as rocks. You know, throwing the rocks. Every subplot is going to make things more challenging for your character. Yeah. It might be a happy subplot, maybe subplot. Maybe someone's gotten pregnant and this is a great thing, mm-hmm. but for your main character it creates problem because they're trying to do something else and that wrinkle makes the, their goal, their main goal more challenging. Right. So even we talk about rocks, but a rock doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be Oh, for sure. Something it's, that just yeah. makes things more difficult on our main character. Yeah. And freaking fairies uh, Beck's main goal is to try to help the fairies, and they've lost a gem that they, quote, borrowed um, from this other group, and this other group, the Naga, are trying to kill the fairies now. And so that's that's the main goal of that book, is she's trying to help the fairies. Right. But I added in subplots. I've got an elf who ends up owning her, which I think I talked about you earlier. You mentioned it a little bit. Um, she has a friend who gets kidnapped and order... To oh, that's right. Yeah, so forgot about that. Yeah, and then it's her. It's her best friend. He owns this this bookstore with her, and he gets kidnapped because they who these people that kidnap her think that they can use him as leverage to get her to do something that they want. There's a girl in trouble that she helps and then brings down an entire race of people on her head because she didn't understand the politics of this fey culture and honestly even if she had understand it understood it she probably would have done it anyway it's a classic beck move that was a classic beck move and then i've got a romantic subplot um with this <laughs> the elf, elf that owns her <laughs> and then she has her ex-husband who is trying to control her and keep her safe mm-hmm. um, while he's married to someone else who hates beck because she feels like her husband is still somehow involved with Beck, which he's not. He just, they met really young. They met in high school and they married in high school. So all of these subplots are going on in freaking fairies, which help drive this main goal of saving the elves or help throw rocks at her in her efforts to save the fairies. Right. Yeah. Um, What else do you have? Uh, I have notes on how to come up with subplots. Great. So... I typically look at my cast of characters, and so this is more like a, you know, secondary character subplot type of way of coming up with subplots. And you gotta, you know, look at them like they're people. What do they want? What are their desires? Does it um, conflict with your main character's desires? And do you think it's a good thing when it does? Yeah. Yeah. I think think so. so. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing if they don't either, but I think you're gonna have more tension and you're gonna have more conflict and story if they do clash. I agree. Um, and it's a lot more fun to write, in my opinion. I think so, too. <laughs> yeah, so, like, what is the main goal for each of them? If it conflicts with the main characters, like, what are the, you know, what are the issues that that's going to cause? Um, what are the challenges that are keeping them from their own goal? And, you know, outline outline their stories just like you would your main characters. And I think that's a really good way to at least start looking at subplots with your stories. So, I mean, how do you do that? That's It's one thing to say... You know, that this is where I'm thinking we go back to the plot generators. Right. Because sometimes my mind just goes blank. I look at all my characters and, and I'm just going, I don't know what to do. Yeah, but if you've come up with a character, you have to have some kind of idea True. of who they are, right? Like, what so do they want? Maybe you start thinking about those secondary characters and their lives. You start developing their backgrounds and their stories and that maybe that will lead to a subplot definitely i think that's ap- like that's actually necessary is to okay. outline your characters and to get to know them like you know your main character because say you have you know your main character and she's outgoing and she wants to be everywhere and she wants to talk to all these people and then you have the secondary character who's maybe her roommate by random choice or whatever by like random assignment in a college town or something like that and the, the roommate is like i don't want to I don't want to talk to people. I'm a little, I'm a loner, like whatever. But then your main character is like, I want to throw a party this weekend. (laughs) And that's going to cause some conflict. And there is like a little subplot there because maybe the roommate will start having resentment. Or maybe the roommate will be like, oh, I met someone at one of your parties. You know, you're going to have... I was just about to say, and then that party could spark the, the next subplot. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I think 
you know, just take a look at who you have in your cast. And if you have ideas for characters already, then I think you can go somewhere. And and I think, you know, I talked a little bit last week about my methods of finding a plot. Mm-hmm. I think you could do that with uh, all of your characters as well. So I like that idea. Yeah. Okay. So another uh, thing that I was thinking of as far as subplots go is we had talked about shadow characters before. That's right. Yeah. And those characters can be uh, really handy in increasing tension, but they can also be the subplots like you were just talking about. Right. Um, Think of your uh, character having to deal with a shadow character to obtain obtain something that they need. Right. So you need, uh, you know, in a typical fantasy, you're going on a quest. Yeah. And you need an item to go on the quest. Right. So in order to get that item, you have to deal with this person that you need this item from. And that could be a shadow character, which would be a subplot of how difficult it is to get this item. She's got to overcome this issue to get whatever it is that she needs to move on with her, her, um, her quest. quest. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Um, so I did have some stuff from last week's episode that that I wasn't able to get to, but it fits with, uh, subplots. Okay. Um, and one of those was was backstory. I think backstory needs to be a part of your main plot, but it can also be a subplot, I think, because, um, you know, everybody that you talk to about writing will say, oh, sprinkle sprinkle your backstory throughout the novel. Don't, Correct. Don't dump it all in the right. uh, exposition. And so I think that inherently can make it a, back, or a subplot. A subplot. Right. That's a, that's, that's a very... Good thought. I hadn't thought of that as yeah. being a subplot. I mean, it, to me, it's necessary, and to me, it happens, but I never thought of it as being a subplot in and of itself. Yeah. But it I is. Think so. I think you're right. Because I think it also lends to the character growth, because if you know some backstory, mm-hmm. um, you know, Mac was, uh, in my current work, Mac was a, a foster kid, and so she's obviously going to have some issues. I think we talked about it before with, like, character flaws and, like, that kind See, of thing. See, and backstory can also bring in subplots mm-hmm. in that there are going to be peop- relationships mm-hmm. from the past that might pop up in this work. And so backstory can help bring those characters in. It could add another character to the story. Someone shows up from her foster world in the past that right. was trouble, that was always trouble. This is not the time she needs it because she's dealing with all of this backlash from outing magic. I mean, you know, maybe this character from her backstory shows up thinking, oh, she's magic. She can give me something yeah you know? so, no yeah. exactly i like that yeah i think it can definitely lend to current subplots and it can be a subplot on its own i think it also adds to tension um which was another point that i had for last week that i wasn't able to get to and um you want to have conflict in in every scene every scene should be its own little three act story mm-hmm. um and i think subplots are along the same the same lines your subplots need to be a full story um, do, you, do you think there's ever a time when you can have too many subplots, or is that not such? Is there is no such thing? No, I think there is such a thing as too many subplots. You don't. I feel like it would make my speaking personally. I think it would make my books too complicated. Mm-hmm. I feel like it would bog down the story that I'm trying to tell. I guess. And it might. Your reader might get too overwhelmed and say, "You know what? I don't care about anybody." Overwhelmed and There's confused. Too much and, going yeah. on. I don't care about this story anymore. Yeah. So in, yeah, in my opinion, I think you can you can have too many. So how do you come up with that balance of? I mean, for me, it's just what feels right. Yeah. So I, I don't know how to explain how I know how that, many is yeah. too many, mm-hmm. which ones are right, and which whatever. Mm-hmm. Um. So I do have. A few things about that, but it ties into weaving subplots into a story. Okay. Um, which I know you have some notes on too. So before mm-hmm. we move to that, do you have anything else? No, nope, that was everything I had so far. Okay, cool. So weaving subplots into a story is like a whole thing on its own. I feel like it's a it's a whole other beast. And and when you started writing, you did not agree with me on the term of weaving. That you were. Um... I know. I know. I was very against it for some reason, which, you know, now, as I am now, like, I, I completely you understand. Yeah. But, I mean, to me, each subplot can be, okay, so think in your brain about pieces of thread and that your book is a tapestry and you are weaving in these stories and 
So, like, when we were writing Kitten, mm -hmm. the, the werewolf story, yeah. Yeah. we would have this thread, and something would happen, and that's where the needle goes into the canvas or into the tapestry. And then it stays under the tapestry, and all this other stuff is going on, and then it comes back up, mm -hmm. just like a needle and thread, and it's being woven mm -hmm. into this tapestry. And I, I love that concept. Mm -hmm. I have always thought in terms of weaving a story. I, I like it a lot now, too. So I was adamantly against it, and that might have been rebellious teenage. It could be. I don't like it. You were young when we started that book, and and you were learning on your own, too. Yeah, definitely. So. And now, I mean, I've been writing for upwards of eight years now, so I've learned a lot, and I, and I completely agree with the weaving analogy. Mm -hmm. I think it makes a very good image for, you know, explaining how a plot works for a book. And... Okay, so we talked about plot holes last week. Mm -hmm. When you have a plot hole, weaving allows you to pop up that that part of the subplot and mend that hole. Yeah. You you know, just envision sewing or weaving, you know, this... I think this, your tapestry analogy was This was thread good. comes mm -hmm. up, you've got a hole, this thread can pop up when we hadn't had it in there originally and mend that hole. Yep. And it allows you to do that. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, do you have a specific technique to go about weaving your subplots into your stories? You know, I don't. It just, it it's kind of the way I cook. It just, <laughs> until it looks until right, it looks until right. it feels right. Ask her for a recipe and you don't you don't get one. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I failed my children because I, I'm just like, until it looks right. <laughs> but, it, you know, I'll be reading, and I, I write differently than you write. You write straight through yeah. and then rewrite. Yep. I rewrite, rewrite, rewrite as, as I'm you going. Go. Right. And I still have to rewrite after. Mm -hmm. But I perfect, I mean, perfect is used loosely. <laughs> Nothing is perfect. But I write and rewrite all the way through. So I do have these little strands so that, and, and sometimes it's just this amazing, oh my God, this, this thread would go perfectly here and I tug it and I, weave it in and it, mm -hmm. it's just amazing and it works. yeah it right. does you know i was thinking about game of thrones like you were talking about game of thrones yeah. and you talk about thread that man's tapestry oh. is incredibly woven intricate it is um the wheel of time series have you read the wheel of time you asked me that last week i'm sorry <laughs> i forgot i know no, courtney's I, read it yeah i have um courtney has read it mm -hmm. uh i have the first book but i haven't read it yet that series high fantasy again i mean obviously you can tell we're all we love fantasy and Definitely. whatever whether it's horror fantasy or high fantasy or urban fantasy we love all fantasy um but the wheel of time is an incredible story from just like game of thrones you have all these characters and but i would say that both game of thrones and wheel of time are more rather than weaving mm -hmm. they're more parallel plot lines oh well, I think Game of Thrones has, you know, parallel plot lines as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that those books are more parallel stories, which I'm starting to think this book I'm working on now, my very first book, yeah. might have to become a parallel plot line. Because I can't... I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to need help with this. The, the main character is extremely naive... She's very young. She's not super likable yeah. because in her, she was raised in, you know, think about along the lines of Dungeons and Dragons, back the old Dungeons and Dragons. Because I wrote this, it was 30, 40 years ago that I started writing this book. And But you're only 29. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right. No, silly me. So it had the, the good, evil, neutral type thing. Right. Um, I don't know what I was talking about now. <laughs> you were talking about uh, parallel plot lines. And you were talking oh, yes. about how... Oh, okay. yes. So because she she is ultimate good. How, how interesting is that? Yeah. That is not super interesting. Right. And I've got one that's super evil, you know, ultimate evil. And she's not interesting. When you have that kind of total black and white, it is not... Which I get your, I get your problem with it because I also know the end. Mm-hmm. And but it ties in beautifully. It does, but I'm thinking to write it, I might need to use parallel lines so that I have, um, I'm just, I'm thinking of The Wheel of Time, which yeah. you haven't read. But, I know. But, you know, 
there are so many characters and, and it's their individual timeline and yes they 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 interconnect and I think that may be how I'm gonna have to write this because we can only take so much of Kayla at one time before we're just like she is stupid she is young she too is much of a Mary Sue too much of a Mary Sue yeah. and, and she has to be that way and and her twin sister has to be the other way that that is the way this book has to go um, which I can't say why because of, I don't want to give up what's going on but right because of that, I think I'm going to have to write chapters from the point of view of um, her, her um, spiritual advisor. And, oh, yeah. You know, from the people on their quest. It's a, it's a definite high fantasy where there are quests and things that have to go on. But they pick up these characters as they go. And so I've got other people I can further the plot through writing from their points of view. Definitely. I think I, I, I think that'd be a good idea. I think that's the only way I'm going to be able to get through this this story. Yeah. Which sounds like it'll be fun to rewrite. I, I am very excited about it. Because one of my favorite things to do with my books is to go back and, like, write a scene from a different point of view mm-hmm. and, like, how that character oh, views it. That's a great idea. Oh, it's one of my favorite things to do. It is so much fun. I have never done that. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Um, because it gives you a different perspective and from a different uh, viewpoint of that oh, conflict. That's brilliant. I have not done that. I'm I'm definitely going to have to use that. It's a lot of fun. It's one of my, it's definitely one of my favorite things to do with my books and my characters. Cause I love all of my characters too. Like I'm very attached to like my secondary mm-hmm. characters. So it's fun to write from their points of view yeah. and kind of see, you know, what's going on in their head as this giant event is happening. And you've already written it from the main character's point of view. So like, I what is, it. what are they thinking about? Um, so that's, it's fun to do. I re- yeah, I recommend it. So what else did you have on weaving? So I'm going to go back to the David Moss book that okay. I've been working with Mm -hmm. um and he actually has a whole chart that he uses to create and weave subplots into the main plot really it's really neat um so i'll go through it and again it's david moss and the um writing the breakout novel books Uh, i can't recommend it enough it's he's got some really good information in it he's got a workbook that goes along in it that you can you know use for your own books if you're writing so i'll go through this uh weaving a story chart and i've used it and it's actually it's kind of like a plot generator. Okay. Um, in the way that it is, and, and I'll, I'll just go through it really quick. Okay. So you make three columns. The first column is your characters. So list out all the characters in your novel. Okay. The second, uh, the second column is your narrative lines. And what that is is, you know, a summary of that character's story or goal. Um, for, for each of the characters that you For each of the... those characters. Okay. Um, yeah, so make sure you give yourself enough space to write it out. Okay. Um, or if you're doing it on the computer, then it doesn't matter as much. But... Um, you're going to write out a summary of their, their story or goal, like their main problem, their plot layers, their, you know, any ideas for subplots that you already have for those characters, go ahead and write that down. Okay. Um, and then your third column is going to be settings. So places that those characters spend time. Oh. Um, so for his examples were, you know, like their home or their workplace, or do they have a favorite bar or do they own a business? So places where they spend time. So you have those three columns, and now that you have those, use circles and lines to connect them and weave them together. So use circles and lines to make connections between each of those characters. So it's, you know, you have your main character who spends time in their favorite bar. What other character is going to go to that bar? Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. And so do this randomly. Okay. So don't even, like, don't even think about, you know, what I just said. Is that character going to go to that bar? Right. You're not even trying to come right. up with that at that point. So do it randomly and see what happens. And if, if something go like if something in your brain is just like, oh, I like that that character is going to go to that bar. What's going to happen if they go to that bar? Mm-hmm. You know, their story is telling them this. You know, how is their story going to interact with another character who's going to end up at that same bar? Um, is there any conflict there? And if there's not, it's fine. Like just it's random lines, and that connection doesn't have to happen. But if you make those random connections and for some reason they seem to work out and you have a story there, use it. Interesting. You know, I, I think we do a lot of this subconsciously ourselves. I think so too. Speaking exactly of that issue with the bar in Frickin' Fairies, I have, there is a bar that a whole bunch of people end up at, at the same time through, it was not on purpose on my, I didn't plan it. Right. 
and it worked. Yeah. And it did lead to a subplot of something else that's going to happen later. Yeah. And, and, and other books. Exactly. I've used this uh, story chart, and it it's great because like I was like random you know, random lines, this is not going to work. It's going to be stupid. All of these connections are going to be stupid. Mm -hmm. And some of them were. Like, some of them I was like, no, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. But some of them were like, oh, this is really interesting. I didn't even think about these two characters crossing and yeah. what their stories would mean to each other. Yeah. Um, and so I got a subplot out of that. Oh, how neat. Yeah, super neat. And, and by doing that, you have a way of weaving it into your story because if they do interact with that main character or if they interact with another character that's important to the main plot, you're automatically weaving it into your plot. So even if it is a subplot, it's still important to that main plot. That's interesting because in, in this bar scene in Frickin' Fairies, mm -hmm. something happened when these characters that I didn't expect to meet met, which led to the epiphany that I got in tying everything up at the end. It was totally unexpected. Yeah. Um, but it did. It led to this little subplot that advanced my main plot to and where I needed it to bring go. Bring it all together. Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, so that's that story chart that I have and it's I've used it for multiple novels. I've I've uh, especially used it for my Aura series. Um and I've done that. That's not on a one book scale, that's on a multiple book multiple book scale. Um and I did it instead of for subplots, I actually used it for main plots. Which, you know, I think we need to do another podcast about mm -hmm. series plots. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Because a lot of fantasy is series, mm -hmm. you know, not just especially urban or, fantasy, especially urban fantasy. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever read a standalone urban fantasy. Patricia Briggs actually had a standalone. Is it urban fantasy? Mm, no, it might be. It, it might not have been. I'm pretty sure she did high You're fantasy right. and mercy. It was, was her high first fantasy. Mm -hmm. You're urban right. Fantasy. You're yeah. right. But um, I think that we could talk a whole lot about how to go about, because this is something that, I have struggled with because all of my stories are series. How do you how do you make this overarching plot go? Especially like with freaking fairies, there's no definite end to that. Right. There, oh, that could go on forever. Yeah, it could yeah. go on forever. So how do I keep an overarching plot line going? I think that would make an interesting episode. Yeah. So yeah. We'll, we'll have to do that. Let us let us know if that's something that you all want us to do. But I, I think we might do that even maybe next week since we're on plots right now that's true but we will we'll go from there i think that that that's a good idea we'll, we'll research it and see if we can come up with enough for a uh, episode yeah i think i think that's a good idea do you have any more on subplots so i think that's mostly it i think i have you know don't let it overpower your main plot mm -hmm. um you have a main plot for a reason so i think make sure that that's in the forefront and if one of your subplots is overpowering it, then maybe that should be your story. That's that's um, true. Good point. And this is general you. I, I'm not trying to teach. This is how I think about like my right. my works. Yeah, um, neither neither <laughs> one of us are uh, have the authority to teach, but it's just fun to talk about and to yeah. explore these ideas. I think so too. So I think yeah, I think it's important to not let it overpower your main plot or if it does, then maybe you should rethink your story yeah maybe the story I, you know i was having problems with my hello series it's an elemental series about mm -hmm. um, elementals and uh, the alignments of planets and things that uh, it, it's interesting but it, it's a romance what was my point i don't know <laughs> what were we talking about? i've had most of my margarita now, yeah mine's so. gone <laughs> oh i know what you were gonna say we were talking about not letting it overpower your main plot oh so when i was writing hello I, I was right. I, I came to a point where I was struggling and I realized I had started with the wrong character. Mm -hmm. So my, my series, my elemental series is going to be from a different point of view of uh, a different person in each book. And as I was writing Hallow, who I started as she was my, my first character, yeah. I realized her sister, Yesmere, mm -hmm. was actually the starting point. Yeah. And so I ended up having to start Yesmeray's story, and Hallow's is is going to weave in and out of that same timeless. Things are going to have occurred at the same time in those yeah. two books. But I realized Hallow needed to be a subplot. Yeah, Hallow, and not necessarily a subplot, but she was a a separate book. Sure, she was yeah. a secondary book. But she will be a subplot, like in your yes, first book. Yes, in my first book, mm -hmm. she will be. So. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was interesting how that, and I'm still working on that series, and I, and I actually have had one of the other siblings. There's a whole bunch of siblings mm -hmm. that 
um, are coming through. So I'm not really sure now who is going to be first. Right. Because as I started writing Yes, Marae, I realized, mm, I don't know. Yeah. So that was what my point was, is that, you know, you might have to change your, your story. Just be, don't get yourself stuck and saying, this is my story, this is my main character, this is how it has to go, because it might It doesn't have to be. Yeah, it might not be. Keep yourself open to change. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay. Um, And then the last thing I have is make sure your subplots are resolved in some manner by the end, whether that end is 10 books from now or the same book. Um, Don't leave your reader hanging. Yeah, because that will be very dissatisfying for yes, them and definitely. yeah definitely need an end to subplots because i think just like your main plot you know they they also have a beginning middle and end i agree so you have interview questions for us this week i do i have one if you could pick any urban fantasy world to visit which one would it be and why oh my gosh I would like to visit so many i know i couldn't really pick one either. i mean i can i have one picked out but um that's really difficult to it is you know i kind of think you know there's several that i would be curious to visit like karen moni's moni's world i don't know that i want to visit it as it ends right up, yeah because it's a little scary it's a little spooky i, I think maybe the grave witch oh that's series, a good one where because there's folded yeah. And you can go into fairy and you have these fairy bars that are yeah. nexuses between the fairy world. No, that's a great choice. I, I think that would be, I would love to go visit. I wouldn't want to live there. No. Because there's too many things, the fae in that world are I don't very know that scary. I want to live in any of the that's urban true. fantasy worlds. I mean. Well, and I was also thinking about Kate Daniels. But I, I thought about that too. I yeah. don't want to live there either because the, the having to live between the shift between magic and technology would would be very uncomfortable right yeah. so probably the grave witch series man that's, that's a great choice mm-hmm. uh my initial thought was the mercy thompson world mm-hmm. just because magic is out in the open there now that's i don't know if that's true. a spoiler but <laughs> a spoiler alert <laughs> but i think i think it'd be very fun to see how you know the world works there now that it is um, cause you know, we only get glimpses of it. We That's can see true. through Mercy's eyes how it, how it is. Yeah. Um, but from, you know, an outsider's perspective, I'd love to see how it works that way too. You know, Joe Schmo in South Carolina, how does he yeah. view the world? Yeah. So I think it'd just be interesting to visit that world. Plus I'd love to meet Mercy. Me too. <laughs> She's great. She's good character. So, she is. Good um, person. I think I would visit the Mercy, Mercy Thompson world, but I thought about Kate Daniels. Okay. Because right. just because that world is so interesting, the way that they built it. Yeah. So neat. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thank you so much for listening. And we, I'm going to give you our email address because that's where you have to email us once you leave your review for us. Uh, eat dot drink dot write dot podcast at gmail dot com. Go ahead and enter so you can win some good stuff. We have Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and patreon patreon oh please visit our patreon <laughs> p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash edw podcast um we could use your support it does cost money to um, do these these podcasts and any help that you can give us would be greatly appreciated definitely all right thanks very much thank you guys